Welcome to Grab the MD. Be sure to subscribe, give a thumbs up, and spread the word. All right, it's time for some more equations. These will be the highest yield equations that are guaranteed to show up on exam. So let's start off with the equation for driving pressure inside an artery. It's really true for any vessel like the veins and capillaries, but we focus on arteries for now. The equation is P equals Q multiplied by R. It's in alphabetical order, so it's easier to remember. P, Q, R. P is the pressure that drives the blood forward. Q is the volume of blood flowing inside the artery at a given time. And R is the resistance faced by blood flow when the artery tries to constrict and some other factors we will discuss later. The value of Q or flow rate can be determined by multiplying speed or velocity of blood flow with cross-sectional area of a vessel. Let's say this is a vessel where blood is flowing at a particular speed, not really 100 miles per hour. And this is the cross-sectional area of the vessel. Let's rearrange this equation for speed, which equals Q divided by A. Doing this tells us speed is inversely related to cross-sectional area of the vessel. That is, if we increase the area, speed of blood flow is decreased. For example, capillaries have the highest total cross-sectional area in the vascular system. So the speed of blood flow is the lowest inside the capillaries. You might wonder how come capillaries have the highest cross-sectional area when they are so tiny. This is because we take into account all the capillaries in the body when measuring their cross-sectional area, hence the word total. This slowing down of blood flow inside the capillaries allows sufficient time for nutrient and gas exchange. Let's go back to our original equation. We can rearrange this equation for resistance. So resistance equals P, which is the driving force, divided by Q, which is the flow rate. Due to some magic of physics, this later portion of the equation becomes 8 times viscosity of blood multiplied by length of the vessel divided by pi cross R to the 4, where R is the radius of the vessel. Remember the small r is for radius, not resistance. Resistance is shown here by a capital R. So this modified equation tells us that resistance has a direct relation with viscosity. If we increase viscosity of the blood, we increase resistance to blood flow. When do we have increased viscosity or a thick blood? We see this in multiple myeloma where we have increased production of antibody light chains. These light chain proteins enter the blood and make it thick. We also see thick viscous blood in polycythemia where we have a ton of RBCs in the blood. So these two conditions result in increased resistance to blood flow. What happens if we decrease viscosity? Decreased resistance to blood flow. What conditions give us decreased viscosity? Nephrotic syndrome, where we lose protein in the urine, so there's less protein in the blood, making the blood thin. Anemia, where RBC numbers are down, so the blood is thin. That's how these two conditions result in decreased resistance to blood flow. As per equation, Resistance is directly related to length of the vessel. So if we increase the length, blood will have increased resistance inside that long vessel. But length of vessels normally stays constant, so the examiners don't ask much questions about this. The important thing is knowing resistance is inversely related to radius to the power 4. How do we change radius of a vessel? We should know vessels have alpha-1 receptors, beta-2 receptors, and muscarinic M3 receptors. When the alpha-1 receptors are stimulated, the vessel constricts, decreasing the radius. 
when beta-2 and muscarinic receptors are stimulated, the vessel dilates, increasing its radius. It's important to note here that little changes in radius of the vessel bring about very large changes in resistance because of the fourth power of the radius. So if we increase radius, resistance decreases by a large fraction. If we decrease radius, resistance is increased by a large amount. This is a high yield concept and examiners like to test this in one of two ways. Number one, if we increase radius two times, what happens to resistance? Resistance decreases 16 times, that is, it will be 1 16th of the original resistance. Let's say original resistance was 1, 1 to the power 4 equals 1, so resistance in this case equals 1, or let's call it 1R. When we increase the radius 2 times, 2 to the power 4 equals 16, so the new resistance is 1 by 16, or 1 16th of the original resistance. The second question they ask is what happens to resistance if we decrease the radius by half or 50%. Resistance is increased 16 times by the same logic we discussed earlier. So decreasing the radius by half, half to the power 4 equals 1 by 16. 16 goes up, so the answer is 16 or the resistance has increased 16 times compared to original resistance. That's one difficult math, but if you remember the number 16 and which way resistance goes when we change the radius, you can answer most of the questions without doing the math. That's because examiners always try to use the words twice and half or 50 rather than three times or five times because that's a much more complicated math and they know it. So they keep it simple because they are not testing your math skills. So where do we face the maximum resistance to blood flow in our vascular system? The arterioles. Arterioles in fact provide most of the total peripheral resistance. So how do we calculate total resistance? Well, it depends whether the arteries are connected in a series or a parallel circuit. A series circuit looks something like this. Arteries feeding a single organ are connected in series, for example the large intestine. There is a big artery feeding it and then some arteries connected in series perforate the intestine. So how do we calculate the total resistance of a series circuit? By adding individual resistances like R1 plus R2 plus R3 and so on. Let's say R1, R2 and R3 are all equal to 2. 2 plus 2 plus 2 gives us a total resistance of 6. A parallel circuit looks like this. It's seen between different organs of the body. For example, the heart, liver and the kidneys are connected in a parallel circuit. To calculate total resistance of a parallel circuit, we invert everything. So 1 over RT equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 and so on. Giving each resistance an imaginary value of 2 gets us 1 by 2 plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 2 which equals 1.5. But 1.5 is the value of 1 over RT and we need a value for total resistance. So we invert the answer. 1 over 1.5 equals 0 0.66. We can see that total resistance in a parallel circuit is much lower than total resistance in a series circuit. That's because organs connected in a parallel circuit offer less resistance to blood flow. So if we add an organ to a parallel circuit, the total resistance decreases further. For example, giving a kidney to a person who had no kidneys. 
If we remove an organ from a parallel circuit, the total resistance will increase, such as seen after nephrectomy or delivery of placenta, which is connected to the mom's organs in parallel. That brings us to the end of this video. We did lots of high yield stuff, so you deserve a break, but be sure to subscribe to my channel to catch up with upcoming videos.